Welcome back everybody to your not really daily update to something. And <laughs> this is a video I was supposed to have made weeks ago, but life happened and <laughs> shit. So I'm doing it today. What I mean is we're gonna talk about the Light Fantastic, the second Discworld novel. We had our chat after the read-along um two weeks ago, three weeks ago at this point. God, it's been a while. <laughs> so um yeah, two weeks ago, I think. Um, and it was a lot of fun. And I figured I'll just, you know, talk a bit about what happened in that book. So people who have are reading it for the first time will, you know, maybe get some hints and whatnot, what to expect from the book. And then I'll pick out, like, after a while, a bit of the more, like, in-depth kind of things. Um, next up will be, by the way... Um, equal rights and we'll have us a discussion on that relatively soon if you want to join us pick up the book it's short and join the unabridged burners discord um i'll link it below you can join it and um, we can um, uh, discuss and then you can join us for the next chat about uh, discord stuff how does that how does that sound right um so yeah let's get on get on with it right that was Underwhelming. <laughs> anyway, cheers. So yeah, um, The Light Fantastic is the second Discworld novel when you go by publication order. It's been around for a while and it is one of the very, very few, in fact I think it's the, the only one when you go by publication order that picks up immediately after the first novel ends now you remember um the color of magic and this this is probably the only one where i would say it makes sense to if you're starting this world and you haven't read any of them i would say don't read this one before reading color of magic because those two kind of make up one story um i mean you can technically do it um, there is enough explanation of what happened before for it to make sense. But still, <clears throat> just read the other one. I mean, they're both like super short, they're like 200 pages each, so you're not exactly, you know, committing for too much. So I'll assume at this point um, that you have read at least The Color of Magic, which I hope you have because it's a great book. So what uh, to expect in The Light Fantastic? We see a bit of an evolving, like, the Discworld evolving further. We also see a Terry Pratchett style evolving further, where The Color of Magic was a collection of novellas or short stories that were um, kind of shoehorned in something of a framed narrative. This one actually has an ongoing plot without, like, these individual novellas. We're still following Rincewind and the tourist Two Flower, and yeah, it yeah as I said it has an ongoing narrative. It's still rather like all over the place, and it's still um, much more fanciful than later Discworld novels in a lot of ways. There's also stuff going on that um, <laughs> doesn't really work with later Discworld, um, with like later developments in the Discworld. Like world building is still far away from being fully, you know established or anything so there's that but apart from that it's already much more of a yeah much more of a novel i would say so um what else do we get we um obviously uh, get a lot more um really silly jokes um, we get more like magic stuff going on this is like i guess the main thing here we see the um unseen university and um like wizard orders and stuff and this is something that will never crop up again wizards will afterwards never i think maybe in sorcery i'm not quite sure but apart from that i think Wizards will never ever again will um, be ordered in different orders and ranks and stuff like that something that we have still from like the uh tabletop role-playing um world that this like our disc world they pokes a lot of fun at that's where we have these like different ranks that you need to climb up to become a master wizard and so forth 
we have all of that um, um, here. And there's an ongoing, I feel like, overarching theme that I already mentioned before, but I feel it's it, it's much stronger here. And that's the question of fantasy versus mundanity, in a way, or imagination versus mundanity. And it's pretty clear on which side Terry Pratchett comes down on this. This is definitely the side of imagination, fantasy, freedom, and so forth. Um, what else is important to see, like one of the events at the beginning of the book, where we have that huge explosion of magic happening, we um, also get, um, it's a small detail, it doesn't, you know, crop up that much in, the first, in this novel, but it's like a huge influence where we see like um, stalwarts of the Discworld setting being um, introduced, that being the librarian who is turned into an orangutan really early at th in this point through magic. And um, yeah, keep him in mind, he'll become more important in later books. Also, he's cool. Um, what else do we see? We see a bit of an evolution of the character of death in this one, which is getting closer to where death the way death will be in later Discworld novels. We remember in Color of Magic, um, death was very much the Grim Reaper without like a sense of humor and without that much of a personality. He was just like very angry at not getting, at Rinspin not being in time for his appointment. And um, we even saw him do like, um, in the first like part of Color of Magic, he kind of actually takes the life of people because it, or flies <laughs> because he is that angry which kind of goes against his character in later novels where he cannot just voluntarily kill people that's not what not not how it works for death at this point so um there's that um he's much more that kind of like the death we'll see in later novels here with that memorable appearance really early on when he gets summoned by the wizards through the right of Ashk Ente, which will crop up in later novels as well. It's one of these like things that we'll see in this world. In general, it's established here. It's like there is a magic ritual where you can summon death, and death will then have to answer your questions. And sometimes people do that. Um, now, answering questions, like asking questions, is kind of the trick because you might not get the answers that you want. And we have that amazing scene at the beginning when he's called in <laughs> and has apparently been at a party, which, you know, a, is a fantastic joke on, like, Edgar Allan Poe's Mask of the Red Death when, just the other way around, but it's like, he, everyone thinks he's dressed up as death, and, um, yeah. <laughs> he is uh, kind of dreading the point at midnight when they expect him to take off his, uh, take off his mask. But anyway, um, we have that... Um, we have obviously a few other, um, um, how to say, um, main themes that are getting, you know, made fun of. We get the introduction of um, Cohen the Barbarian, greatest hero of the Discworld, and obviously a um, parody of Conan the Barbarian, but um, yeah. He's, he's a fasc fascinating character in his own right, um, making fun of the fact that he might be older, <laughs> that even barbarians get, grow old, and what can you do once you have it? <laughs> if there's only one thing you're good at, that being slaughtering monsters, demigods, and whatnot, and rescuing uh, women. And we see Cohen struggling with that, which also, once again, has a lot of like really classic, like, Terry Pratchett taking a memorable scene from a from a classic piece of media and putting it through the disc word ringer, that being the scene with Cohen the Barbarian and the the other people from the, the horse people um, replaying that famous scene from the original Conan, uh, Conan the Barbarian movie um, featuring Arnold Schwarzenegger, which if you have not watched that movie, do yourself a favor, watch that movie at least once in your life. It has an amazing soundtrack. It has almost nothing to do with uh, the original Conan the Barbarian stories by uh, Robert E. Howard, but it captures the mood of those stories pretty well. Um, 
it also features that sad scene which was not um like which was actually is not trick or anything uh, which was not staged where Conan, Conan or Schwarzenegger knocks out a camel because the camel is he, he doesn't like the camel let's put it that way but apart from that watch Conan the Barbarian and you have that scene with a big question Conan what is best in life and they're like or in general asking what is the, the chieftain asking his like lieutenant lieutenants um, who, what is best in life and everyone gives it their answer and you you know the, the great one is slay your enemies and <laughs> humiliate his tribe and hear the lamentation of his women um, and so forth and <laughs> we see a interesting twist put on that by Koan the barbarian interesting side note though is that the, the, the it's not an urban legend it's more like a general like Myth has it that that original saying about the uh, lamentation of the women and humiliation of the tribe and so forth, that whole conversation is originally ascribed in mythology or made up history to uh, um, Genghis Khan and then was just usurped for the Conan the Barbarian movie and then taken from there by. <laughs> um, Terry Pratchett for his important lessons on the values of civilization um, so yeah that was is certainly one of the things that I really appreciate about it there's a lot of like really like where you see scenes are only set up to make one specific really bad pun which I obviously appreciate there's also serious parts in here that we need to talk about a bit more I mean even here where it's mostly um, fun and mostly jokes and silly jokes and wackiness, we see that there's always like to a lot of like humor. There's a serious basis, right? One of those things is right at the beginning when um, Rincewind um, comes to the forest called Skund, which means a forest, you fool, and the idea that. Um, how explorers, and that's being like the idea of like colonialism or um, general dickhead behavior by Westerners coming to places, so called explorers coming to places um, and talking to the indigenous population and asking them about places and then um, giving. <laughs> giving those names and the question there is like those places obviously had like regular you know it deals with the ignorance and arrogance of western superior um, uh, of supposed western superiority um the idea that places are only discovered if a white man goes there and discovers them even though like everyone around them knew about those places all the time and yeah he poses as if it, it's it's a fun joke to say, yeah, of course, if someone grabs a a person, points at a landmark, and speaks slowly and loudly at them, <laughs> they might just take you for an idiot because that's what you are. <laughs> so mountains are called. What is that fool who doesn't know what a mountain is? And well, the forest is called a forest. You fool, because you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly um, but the point is there is that serious undertone that for even for us nowadays like when you look at how a lot of places are called or still called and we have you know reverse names for a lot of places in the world it's because white Westerners Europeans mostly came there and decided to give those places names despite anyone living there and probably having names for landmarks already and we kind of see some places where this is changing or you know where we try to change it but it's certainly something to keep in mind and while it is fun to you know make jokes about it there is that serious undertone in there which you get with Terry Pratchett all the time as I said to not read Terry Pratchett as also a I mean he's a satirist in a lot of ways a satire at its core is political or sociopolitical where he's rarely going to make a you know jokes about very concrete specific political events he's certainly not he you can always see certain you know opinions about the general way we conduct ourselves in society or not society you know <clears throat> that is always in there and it's important to know that and it's important to um, 
keep that in mind while laughing about all the funny jokes. Of course, there's also those. There's like that amazing scene when uh, Two Flower teaches um, a Bridge to the Horseman of the, of the Apocalypse and fails because Bridge is a terribly complex game. And it, there's enough room there for like some really damn good wordplay and jokes in there, but you know, there's that absurdist humor that we find in there, obviously. Well, there's also more serious parts in there. Um, another serious part is the idea of how people deal with um, the arrival of the star. And we have that, like, frankly depressing scene in um, that city that has never actually, never gets a name where they have killed all the priests and all the um, so-called magical races like dwarves and what have you. Um, um, because <clears throat> the star tells them to. And that is obviously, I mean, that's obviously a um, a commentary on, like, how racism works and how fascism works. And it ties into that greater theme that we have in, the, in this novel, that being that fight of, like, imagination and fantasy versus um, order and mundanity, in a way. Because what they want is that grey... Um, destruction of everything that is not in a one specific way and you know yeah fuck those people um, just saying and um, it's it's one of the things that we, where we can see where the character of death will be going because death doesn't understand that idea as well and says it's, it's horrible because that's not how the world should work people should be allowed to live the way they want to live and be the way they want to be and or and or are made by uh, by nature and whatnot. There is no that no one has the right to enforce their personal ideas and will on anyone else in that way. <clears throat> Which you know parallels the um, the wizard um, uh, Trumo, um, who is obviously also portrayed as someone. Well, in this case, obviously, he's also used to poke fun at management theories and whatnot, and um, the idea of uh, building up an order without any substance, which is basically what he is all about. It's like structuring everything and putting the structure in front of um, putting a yeah, putting a substanceless structure in front of um, um, above the individual people. That's sort of what he is, and that's what Rincewind and others are fight, especially Rincewind and Two Flower at the end are fighting. They're fighting for their right to be human and not to be, you know, absor absorbed in this um, terrible um, gray um, world where all you are is like being reduced to a number in a long calculus of numbers and a cog in the machine. That's not what people like Rincewind and uh, Two Flower are about. And it's not what we should be about. And this is like the main and overarching message in um, this Discworld novel. It's something that will crop up again and again, and it's kind of something that already, you know, was hinted at in um, The Color of Magic, but it's a, it's a much stronger theme in this novel, I feel. Another thing that we need to look at. Um, it's the first book, I guess, where we um, see Terry Pratchett talk about um, the depiction of women in fantasy. We obviously have that um, um, hero, that heroine, um, being hired to capture... Um, Rincewind and Two Flower and so forth, and we have that long passage on, like how people are described, or how how female um, characters in fantasy were often described. And if you've ever looked at old um, Dungeons and Dragons, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons rule books and fantasy covers of the seventies and eighties, you probably already know what I mean. <laughs> that being, um, they all look like uh, they can like a lot of these characters look at in, in portraits and pictures and images look like they 
comes straight out of like a 15 year old boy's first um, fetish dream with like chainmail bikinis which make no sense whatsoever or um, a lot of black leather and whatnot which is and uh, Terry Patchen makes the good point that this is very much unrealistic and only there for the gratification of the writer the um, painter or the reader and he kind of starts pointing out that this is dumb and that this is not the case it um, works here in this world which is one of the main themes that we'll see through the entirety of the Discworld series um, gender equality is something that we'll see a lot as one of the main themes that uh, Terry Pratchett um, has managed to put into his novels all the time. There's a few others, but this is one of the main themes and it crops up here for the first time because the way, um, I mean, there weren't that many um, female characters in um, The Color of Magic. Um, there's obviously Liesa, the, the, the dragon lady, and she's described exactly in that way, but I mean, yeah, it's it's kind of over the top, but there's the meta commentary that we get here um, is missing. I guess that's another thing that we have a bit more here um, compared to um, the color of magic, and something that we'll see more of in later Discworld novels as well is Terry Pratchett as the author, this like, addressing us as the readers directly, making meta commentary. We obviously still have his like odd sense of metaphor and odd sense of description in a lot of his um, that we see, especially when he comes to describe thoughts of characters, mostly real swims in this case. Um, those things are obviously there, and as I, as I've pointed out before, those are hallmarks of Terry Pratchett's style, and if you personally don't like that idea or that way to describe thought and the way the to describe things with like very odd um i don't want to call it anachronistic because that's not exactly what it is but you know that way of using real world our world nowadays examples to explain um in you know emotions dreams thoughts and whatnot in this world is something that will stay with us throughout all of those novels um, what else is interesting? <clears throat> oh yeah, there's another like commentary that I'm personally like very fond of, even though I'm also fond of the subject matter, which I guess is you know part and parcel of it. And um, that being the druids, I love the druids. Um, now get no, no get, don't get me wrong, I um. <laughs> I've known people who do, uh, do Celtic studies and stuff like that. I've read a bit of that stuff. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Robert Graves' uh, The White Goddess for a lot of reasons. I might actually, you know, do a video on it later on. Well, not today, but in the near-ish future. Point being, um, the description of the Druids, apart from the idea that their stone circle are basically a computer giving Terry Pratchett in, like, the early 80s, a chance to make jokes about uh, that <laughs> that are still valid about users and computer technicians and the inability of users to actually properly use computers. This is very much IT crowd <laughs> in Discworld in a way when we have that druid ride, uh, drive or fly the rock to the stone circle to replace another part of the computer. There's certainly that. But I'm talking more about the idea of how in the romanticizing, um, romanticization, I, oh God, that's a word that I should not know. In the way we have romanticized, um, or some people have romanticized throughout the New Age movement and stuff like, you know, the Irish um, romantics um, and then people like Robert Graves and so forth, we've romanticized the way um, druidic culture, Celtic druidic culture worked, because the problem is we don't have, like, a lot of sources. We have sources that are either Christian or um, Roman, which both are not the people who actually did stuff there. And then we have like, in a lot of ways, we have taken out the darker parts of possible human sacrifice in the way we portray our Merlins and whatnot and Druids, like, you know, you have your Asterix and 
um, druids there. Yeah, like the idea of the druid wearing a white night shirt, having a golden sickle to cut down mistletoe is ridiculous, as all hell. <laughs> It may just have been a dark and brutal um, human sacrifice kind of religion. And the way he portrays that um, inability of people, of tourists or not modern people to understand or <clears throat> accept that fact is um, just um, fantastic. Another one of those things that I really appreciate about, appreciate about the book. It also gives us one of the really, really good, terrible <laughs> puns that I, I appreciated so much. It took me like, I don't know, three or four readings to actually kind of get it because it's, you know, I'm not the smartest person in the world sometimes. Well, most of the times I'm an idiot. <laughs> that being when they collect all the um, uh, ornaments of the druids. And Cohen the Barbarian just says, like, that's priests for you. Nothing but torque, torque, torque. And I'm like, yeah, that, <laughs> that's ridiculously fun because that's exactly your, your cliche Celtic, like, ornaments being, like, r rings and arm torques and stuff like that. And neck torques and whatnot. So, yeah, that, there's that joke, which I really appreciate. Um, we also get more uh, troll action. And we learn that trolls can be really cool. Trolls here are still very much different from trolls in later uh, Discworld novels in a lot of ways. But we kind of get explained that they are um, silicaceous life forms, uh, which are basically makes them computers, right? They they have like um, impure silicon brains and so forth, you, which sets up stuff for later in the future, which we'll, you know, learn more about in... At the latest, I think, um, uh, Men at Arms, which is, I don't know, book 15 or so. So it's a while until then. Anyway, <laughs> we, um, it, it kind of gets established here. The idea of them having diamond teeth, stuff like that, gets established here. So we see his trolls are not the green knobbly monsters um, that we see in a lot of fantasy, but his are rock trolls made out of rock. So much closer to what you might see um, in, say, The Hobbit, where trolls turn to stone during day, um, if they are out in daylight. So he kind of takes that. It gives us like some really great jokes about trolls um, and, uh, <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's another thing that we'll see more in the future. We also meet our first dwarf, um, you know, Nothing too um, impressive there yet. Dwarves will become more important later on as well. What else would be um, important to look at? Um, maybe the ending? Maybe the ending is interesting as well. I mean, there's like two things that I think are still important. One of them being Rincewind fighting against the Octavo and the great eight spells that have taken control of his life and are using him as a pawn. Um, the idea of independence and higher powers just <coughs> moving us around is something that we'll see again and again with Terry Pratchett not exactly being a fan of any kind of religion or stuff like that as well. So um, that's a theme that will come up again. Um, the the general idea of resistance or rebellion against like preordained fates or outer influences trying to move us to do something is deeply ingrained in Terry Pratchett's writing. Which yeah, I feel um, very partial to. Uh, it's kind of my my kind of thing. And another thing that I enjoyed and I feel is interesting is the way Terry Pratchett manages to um, explain the um, friendship and especially the farewell of um, Rincewind and Two Flower and the the way how in just like very few sentences he manages to ex to just like depict the inability of a lot of <laughs> men to show any kind of emotion or to verbalize their idea, their, their friendship or anything in a way. Um, I just found that very touching and cool. 
just handled well. I, um, I appreciated that. So yeah, let's kind of wrap it up for now, I guess. Um, yeah, the Light Fantastic is the next step after Color of Magic. <laughs> it shows that Terry Pratchett is able to carry on or carry through an entire narrative, like through an entire novel, to make that work. He manages to put in one or two like bigger themes that we will see crop up again and again in uh, throughout the Discworld series. We we get some few like new like facts that remain with the entire world established here. The orangutan. Um, we meet some like staple characters like the orangutan and uh, Cohen the Barbarian, and. Um, yeah, I guess um, I would say it's another one of those really essential Discworld books, but surprise, surprise, I think they're almost all essential, without, like maybe one or two exceptions that I personally don't like that much, but I, I really like this one, maybe more, actually more than The Color of Magic because of the scenes in the forest, which I appreciate a lot. A lot of dumb jokes, and um, the overall message of uh, that fight of fantasy and imagination and freedom to do whatever you want to do and be whoever you want to be, and not be a number in the system. Um, that's that for now. I will might be back later today, but I'm planning to do a barbecue on my balcony, so maybe I'll just burn everything down. If not, you might see me later on talk about another um, Black Company novel. Until then, have a great Sunday, and I'll see you. Or you'll see me. Cheers.